Hey, everybody, this is Peter Joseph, October 6th, 2013. On September 23rd, I engaged a conversation with Stefan Molyneux, some may know him, and he released a review video on October 5th yesterday regarding our conversation. And I was absolutely horrified by the level of dishonesty, the disingenuous nature of this complete fraud. And I would like to make this video really in the context of addressing people that are in the communications team to know what to look for when you're dealing with someone of this nature. There are only two possible realities out there for the mentality that Molyneux possesses. Either A, he is a pathological bullshitter, which means that he doesn't even know that he's full of shit, and he lies and he spins and he twists any point he possibly can to make it appear like he's right, or he is a classic con artist, and I mean that in the most deliberate way. And he has proven to me, in his interest in self-preservation, that he is willing to do whatever he can, as dishonest as necessary, to make things look like he is correct. The first 13 minutes or so of this video, he just sort of rambles on on different subjects, giving himself congratulatory praise in his experience as a debater, and then planting a bunch of very bizarre seeds, which kind of come up later in the video as he prepares to give this misrepresentation of everything that I talk about so he can defend his points. The only true point made is when he talks about the opening of our discussion around 1308, with the incredible con artistry to frame my opening agreement with him, which wasn't in full agreement at all, as I'll play in a moment. And in pure douchebag form, he tries to get the audience to think that I contradicted myself right at the very beginning, which is not at all what happened. To begin with, now Peter said, after I made this case, he said, okay, I absolutely agree with everything you stated. And I was like, bah! I mean, that's like I'm trying to land a punch and boom, <laughs> he just knocks himself out. So he agrees with absolutely, so he agrees that we don't have a free market. He agrees the government controls all the money, the government controls education, the government has severely disrupted families, and therefore we have a state-produced human being. I absolutely agree with everything you've stated. I guess what I would disagree with is where this root causality rests, where this power distortion, where this bubbling wave of, of insecurity and necessity by the state to conduct all of these affairs where, where the, the crony capitalism, so to speak, where the, the interest to take control of the money uh, originates in its core philosophical foundation. The, the fundamental prim principles that I want to put forward take all, everything you've just said, which again, I completely agree with, but you're not describing a root source of why these mechanisms are actually materializing. So ignoring my basic root objection, which was pretty much the whole point of my entire conversation with him, he then proceeds to describe how he's already won the debate. So he's really just setting up the audience and getting his little bullshit machine going so the audience kind of feels like he's right, even though he hasn't addressed anything. The next thing he says, really abruptly, is how, oh, and interrupting. Well, hey, it's a debate. We're supposed to interrupt. Interrupting. Well, it's a debate, people. Come on. I mean, grow up. A debate is where you go back and forth. A debate is not, he gives a speech and I give a speech. A debate is back and forth. And Peter himself said at the very beginning, you're free to interject throughout this. You're free to interject throughout this is not to be considered. You're free to interrupt me in the middle of my points as many times as you like. And you'll notice that I never at any point interrupted him unless he interrupted me first. Now, after about 16 minutes of more or less pointless conjecture and framing himself in a way that best prepares the audience to accept what he's about to say as true, he makes his first point. The first issue that jumps to me, says Peter, is what I call the denial of principle continuum. Now, just to begin with, it's usually not a great idea to invent your own words. Like if I said, uh, uh, I'm right because of the principle of philippity gibbet ole for tang for tang biscuit barrel. This is just fantastic as a point of manipulation. Are any of those words invented by me? It's a sentence. And continuum fallacy is actually a noted thing. You can punch it up on Wikipedia. And this kind of stuff gets to the heart of his hyper-reductionist douchebaggery. I apologize to everyone out there that thinks this is too intellectual. I kind of thought this is a philosophical audience, that people are well-read, and they can actually understand, put words together. Not to mention that I actually define everything as I go along. So for those out there that are too lazy to actually look into this kind of very common language and pure frankness, I'm sorry. But this is the way I talk. Get used to it. For example, the state, which of course I agree with your basic criticisms as far as effects, but the problem is that there's an erroneous separation of behavior and the creation of the state from the underlying philosophical principles inherent and intense, I should say, inherent to the historical premise of the market system. 
Now, my alarm bells bing, bing, <laughs> began to go off a little bit here because he's using the word fallacy and erroneous and so on, but he's not actually showing me how I'm incorrect, right? This is usually not a good sign. Well, that might be because it's an introductory statement to try and prepare the audience for what's going to be described. But of course, that's largely frivolous with Stefan, because even if you make an evidence-based proposition, even if you state something that's actually sourcing history, statistics, and everything else, he simply interprets that as just a declaratory statement with no evidence. This is how he argues. It's fascinating. However, in defense of this, to summarize a few of the points I made, all government systems have historically been based around economy and commerce. From slavery to feudalism to mercantilism to capitalism to communism as it existed, the state has always been a manifestation in tandem of economic means, period. How you could deny that is complete delusion. Second point of evidence to show this constant breeding between the two, and hence the continuum fallacy that is clearly evident in the anarcho-capitalists, is the historical fact that the state institution has been run by the most powerful players in commerce and industry since day one with kings running ships to our now inverted totalitarianism, where the most dominant commerce institutions clearly have control over the war machine, political parties, utilities, and everything else. I also draw the clear connection between the mafia mentality, this, this criminal control that is in, inherent in competitive advantage. And if you need evidence of that, just take a look at the list of prosecuted politicians and corrupt officials that have gone back God knows how many millennia, all based around their self-interest towards commerce one way or another. If you can't see that, I don't know what to say. And if, if he doesn't agree with that, that's fine. But don't turn this around to say that I haven't provided ample evidence with respect to the defense of this continuum fallacy that I have put forward with respect to the separation of the state and this idea of the market. Like later in the debate, and we'll get to this, I said to him, I said, stop telling me that I'm wrong and show me that I'm wrong. Stop calling my arguments a truncated frame of reference. Stop calling my arguments simplistic, stop like, fallacious and so on. Tell me how they are, right? Otherwise, you're just using an ad hominem against the argument, ad hominem. The great highlight of all of this was when he decided it was an ad hominem attack when I said that his ideas were truncated and simplistic, which are actually very qualifiable terms. I didn't mean that to say you are truncated and simplistic. What my entire argument against everything that he said was that it was too narrowly defined to be viable, and I gave an enormous amount of evidence for those, of course, that can hear it. Uh, sorry, let me start again. The market necessity of competition, self-preservation, differential advantage, and self-interest does not and would never stop at the traditionally assumed edge of the market board game, if you will, where the referees stand. It's like having a football game and assuming everyone is going to stay within the lines. It's not like that when you consider what's at risk. The state and its creation and its use for as a tool for differential advantage is simply another strategy or tool in the gaming strategy of competition. I think that's an incredibly important point. Now, point is one of these words, like, I don't know what it means. I mean, you either make an argument with reason and evidence, or you just make a statement. If you make a statement, it's irrelevant. Actually, there's a very clear point, even though you choose not to recognize it because of your conditioning. I'm talking about competitive advantage and self-interest. I'm talking about the fact that people backed into a corner without the sustenance of life, or resort to crime. They will go outside of the lines, if you will, of what is considered ethical or respectable in the game of commerce. If you examine any so-called prohibitive economy in the world, from drug dealing to prostitution to various levels of crime, these all have a very base root in deprivation, clearly. And virtually every statistical source that relates socioeconomic status to these prohibitive economies shows a correlation. On the other side, you have this power neuroses, this sickness that develops when people get more and more wealth. Why is it that so many people that have great wealth continue to be manipulative and destructive in the world of power and money? That's been rooted in psychological studies to a kind of gambling addiction, to a problem. And I'm not going to go in that here. But there's a great deal of evidence underlying all of this, and it's unfortunate that he dismisses it all. Self-preservation, the mock necessity of self-preservation. I don't understand that at all. I mean, if you lose a business contract, you don't die. If your business goes out of business, you don't die. So it's Holy shit, did he really just reduce everything to a contract? There are people in this world that are struggling every moment of their lives trying to engage commerce against all odds, against a loss of labor, against numerous pressures and public health issues, such as trying to struggle to simply be healthy in the wake of being broke. Self-preservation means staying alive. It also means preserving market share to make sure others stay alive. When a company starts, they take on lots of employees, 
The life of those employees is in the company's hands in many ways. The company wants to do everything it can to keep itself afloat, to keep market share, to keep people employed. Once again, this is part of the competitive nature that's inherent, which works on multiple levels. If you don't understand that, ask yourself why, say, the electric car isn't in full global use. A clear and obvious characteristic of all commerce institutions, call them a business, call them a corporation, whatever, is their interest in self-preservation. They want to keep going and they will do what they need to because their lives are at stake, even if it means being so-called corrupt. It's not self-preservation. I don't really understand that. Differential advantage. I think that means the division of labor, specialization. I don't know. Well, for someone who spent most of our debate time surfing the internet while I was talking, I'm very surprised that he hasn't punched up the term differential advantage. Characteristics that set apart a company from its competitors. It's also basically the same as competitive advantage. It's simply what companies do to make themselves appear to be more effective or efficient than others in public perception. And self-interest. Well, okay. I don't know how self-interest is only related to the market. I don't know how competition is only related to the market. And I don't know how differential advantage is only related to the market. Anyway, but he doesn't really make the case for that. A case for what? What exactly is he arguing right here? You mean a case of the common sense notion that when backed into a corner without food and the like, people will do what they need to survive? Extrapolated into the dynamics of the market system that's inherently competitive on multiple levels? I don't know what to say. I suggest Stefan lose all of his money, get kicked out of his house, be evicted like all the other poor people have, and live on the street for a little while and try to work his way back up with his family. And then maybe he'll have some sense of reality. He then goes on again to this hyper-reductionist douchebaggery to distort my simple football analogy. He said, it's like having a football game and assuming everyone is going to stay within the lines. Oh, it takes a musician and day trader to make such a bad analogy. Uh, I guess no musicians and day traders should be making analogies out there. By the way, I learned everything that I know about the market by studying micro and macroeconomics during my course as an investor. I spent an enormous amount of time in this darkness, not to mention I've been running my own company as an entrepreneur for over 10 years with employees and everything else on and off as I do film productions and the like. I have hired, fired, managed, and done just about everything you could possibly do as an entrepreneur, including understanding the investment basis of most corporate foundations. And what I like most about this attack is it really reveals his true character. He is one walking, passive-aggressive, arrogant prick. For those of you that can see through the noise, you'll notice this exceptionally condescending air of authority radiating from everything that Stefan does as he sits atop of this pedestal as the self-proclaimed philosopher. Yeah, having a football game, assuming everyone's going to stay within the lines, well, you don't stay within the lines. And if he meant stay within the rules, well, yes. You do stay within the rules in a football game, otherwise you lose. Right? When you play tennis, nobody gets to serve three times. Do you see this? Isn't this fantastic? He's creating his own little arguments amongst himself, which he decides to win for his own advantage. It's fantastic. Nothing he's saying right now has anything to do with what my point was in my very simple analogy, that there is a game board that we assume exists in the market, meaning the rules of ethics and by extension the legal structure in many ways. These game rules have never been respected which is why the vast history of corruption is what it is. Now, the state and its creation and its use for it as a tool for differential advantage. So what he's saying is that there were all these capitalist corporations, all these capitalist entities, these free market entities in a completely free society, and they got together to create the state and to use it to dominate each other. This is historically completely false. Anyone paying attention knows I said nothing of the sort. I simply related the fact that there is a tendency within commerce and trade and the market to move towards power consolidation, monopoly, and state control, and any type of overarching structure that can give competitive advantage to one group over another. So please recognize the tactic of constant misrepresentation, which is a trademark of Stefan's argumentative style. I don't even know what to say to you. The idea that there was this perfect free market and out of it emerged a state uh, is um, just not even worth discussing. You're right, because it's fucking stupid. Thanks for making it up on the spot. And then he says... Um, so even if you reset everything right now, and I had this conversation with another friend of mine recently that was trying to describe this circumstance, and they said, if we just got all this stuff in place, it would start to amalgamate and it would change things. I guess this, this falls into the category of logical proof because my friend said it. Well, that's interesting, since I'm actually disproving my friend. I'm actually just giving this kind of anecdotal thing, which did happen in my life, where a guy told me, hey, man, we can put the free market in and everything will be fine. We just got to get the free market there, get rid of the state. 
And I argue that, well, even if you did that, the underlying competitive ethos, the scarcity-driven worldview, the need to keep advantage and all the things that Stefan doesn't understand clearly, that would slowly corrupt the system probably to the exact place we are in right now. So once again, he's completely bullshitting and reinventing these contexts that don't actually exist to try and give this illusion that he's right. As a, even if you reset everything right now, including a lot of the central bank issues you just talked about, removing the so-called state. Again, once somebody says so-called, I don't know what they're arguing. Are they saying it's not really the state? I mean, are you changed in the word? I don't know. Well, of course you don't know what so-called state means. You don't understand the idea of differentiating between two different people's view or two different schools of thought of a particular institution. As I explained numerous times, I don't actually differentiate the state from the system of commerce or the market. I see it as an extension. I see it as just another tool in the tool set of competitive advantage. Groups by whatever means necessary, as history has proven. Well, you see, you can't use any historical arguments because the, the free market as I have defined it has never existed. Now that is fantastic. You're right, he is a great debater because he just said that I can't criticize any attribute of his free market concept because it's never existed. Therefore, the entire anthological basis of trade and human interaction, and commerce and everything else gets thrown right out the window because you can't possibly criticize something that hasn't been put into practice. As I stated repeatedly, repeatedly in this interview, I do not see a differentiation. Therefore, I can criticize. I can use historical logic. I can look at the patterns because I can't separate the idea of this free market utopia from the basic interaction of trade and all of its mechanisms and inherent psychology we see today. A truly brilliant douchebaggery block. Uh, and so when he said that he agreed with me in the beginning, he was saying that because he couldn't find a way to disagree with me because you can't say the government doesn't control money, you can't say the government doesn't control education, you can't say the government hasn't disrupted the family. Well, that might be true. However, I can say that behind the state are corporate powers that have deep financial interests in the inner workings of society to make sure they get the best end of the deal at all time. That's what you fail to understand and what the entire delusion of anarcho-capitalism, Austrianism, and the libertarian philosophy really needs to come to terms with. Now, the next thing he does is he takes a really important point about how you have to have structural reinforcers for certain behaviors to expect that behavior to occur. We have the massive legal structure in place because of the market economy to keep things in some type of order because people naturally deviate away from what we consider ethical or honest. So he says, in other words, if you have a society that isn't structurally reinforcing the idealized behavior, it's not going to prevail as dominant. When he said that uh, there's selfishness and exploitation in the market, uh, I pointed out that in a free market, your customers are with you voluntarily. And if you don't please your customers, then they'll go, they'll leave, they'll cancel their contracts, they'll go elsewhere, they, they'll never come to you in the first place. If you and here is the ultimate reductionist nonsense. The idea that the entire act of commerce, the entire act of trade is the mutual satisfaction, as though that perceived level is all that exists, as though there's nothing else happening, as though there are no externalities. There's no human exploitation and slave labor in the world to achieve that over-the-counter satisfaction, is there? There's no pollution or corporations that, when people aren't looking, dump tons of toxic waste and materials whenever they can to save money. There's no realization that uh, someone might not be able to feed their family because of something out of their control where there's a downsizing of their corporation due to some other competitor's deep advantage. When this market correction, which is natural to the system, could very well get them evicted from their home, there's nothing in advertising by these so-called innocent corporations or businesses, I should say, to manipulate the values of the public to favor their goods, even though in many cases it is the highest expense paid for by any business. Forget about the historical fact of planned obsolescence, which basically screws over the consumer immediately upon purchase, not to mention intrinsic obsolescence, meaning unnecessary waste due to this competitive mechanism to produce the so-called best at the lowest possible price, which doesn't produce the best at all. And I'm sure the tobacco companies really meant well, even though they knew early on that their product was deadly and addictive. But they're trying to satisfy their customers the best they can, especially since they're addicted and they'll just keep coming back for more. Same with the alcohol industry. The fact of the matter is there are more slaves in the world than ever before. I guess that doesn't relate to the market system. The fact of the matter is every life support system is in decline. I guess that doesn't relate to the market system. The fact is we have one of the greatest wealth gaps in history, and that can't possibly be a result of the market system either even though it generates an enormous spectrum of structural violence, both physically and psychologically. 
all of that stuff is external to this bullshit that all trade is, is satisfying this guy on one side of a counter and the other guy. Then he responded with a personal anecdote. Now, trying to draw general principles from personal anecdotes is the definition of racism and bigotry, right? Now, for those out there that think I might have been kind of harsh up until now, hold on to your seats as Stefan compares me with a racist because of my observation. Right, like, so if I said, okay, so let me get into a story. So he basically said, well, for five months, I wasn't paid by my production company. And he said, that's the true face of the market economy, my friend. Once again, manipulative reductionism, that's not even close to what I said. It had nothing to do with me just simply not being paid. I described the very fact that due to market correction, due to the failure of this business, all of us were holding on, hoping it would come back. What this meant is that we could either hold on and hope they come back and get the money they owe us, or we can bail, which we all eventually did when we realized we had no other options. These aren't easy decisions when you have a family to feed. And this piece of shit, Stefan Molyneux, has the balls to turn this around, to make it seem like it's some kind of bias, make it seem some kind of bigoted bias that comes out of nowhere, when the observation is simply the fact that, in my view, and the view of the Zeitgeist movement, the market system is unnecessary and creates unnecessary suffering because of these very mechanisms, which don't need to exist if we elevate it out into a new type of economic structure. And taking one example and generalizing it to everyone, it's kind of mental, right? I mean, it's like me saying, well, I was cheated once by a black guy, so all black guys are thieves. Taking one example and generalizing it to everyone, you know, that's a very interesting point because that's all Stefan ever does. He talked about his little girl's lemonade stand <laughs> as the ultimate point of what trade means in a free market. When the little girl lives with him, she's not going to suffer if no one buys her lemonade. It'd be different if she actually had to make a living and she'd be out on the street if no one paid for her lemonade. First of all, the contradiction is unbelievable since all he does is use tiny little reductionist examples and apply them to larger contexts. Second of all, second of all, drawing this racist card when it is absolutely beside the point of what I've tried to state with respect to the system consequence is, is unbelievable. And I can't believe that anyone listens to this guy. I really can't. And as I pointed out, everything that he was complaining about was actually run by the state and not by the free market. And again, that doesn't, that didn't really, uh, didn't really matter, right? So business failure and market correction is the result of the state then. Brilliant. I'm, I'm a black guy and I grew up in a black community and I have obviously extended black family and friends. I really know the black culture. And this guy comes in who grew up in an all-white neighborhood, who has no black friends, comes in and tells me all about the black experience. It just is kind of, kind of grating. Absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. I can't even think of a lower, cheaper, more con artistry angle to try and make a point and create bias for his audience. Now, I could go on and on because he plays the same tricks over and over again throughout this entire thing. He takes little fragments that I say, and he takes them literally, things that I actually misspeak at times, in fact, which are obviously misspoken in points of tension, and he continues this manipulation. Now, this isn't only just a response because I don't like being personally attacked on this level, which is quite new to me, frankly. I've never seen anything like this. This is also to show that this guy really is destructive in his intentions. You be the judge pathological bullshitter or conscious con artist?